It's just uh, something I really feel the need to do here. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, and adventurers of all ages, as we continue through Baldur's Gate 3, day after day, week after week, everyone is really just scouring every inch of the game and finding new and interesting things. Whether it's your first playthrough or you're really just giving it all the time it could take, or if it's your second or even third playthrough, there are inarguably some items that are easier to find than others, thus some of the items in the game are simply much rarer than those, being in strange places or hidden through puzzles or decisions that very few people have chosen to make. So today we're we're going to talk about 10 exceedingly rare items of Baldur's Gate 3, going in order of acquisition just in case there's anyone around who isn't in Act 3 yet who still wants to see the Act 2 stuff first. Two disclaimers as well, none of these will be legendary items. While they have the highest in-game rarity, of course, they are also pretty well known in the community at this point, so they're actually more common to see people with than these ones I'll be showing you. The other one then is nothing from Act 1. As aside from the bit that was changed, Act 1 was in early access for PC for literally years, so it was really just combed and checked completely before the game was even officially released. All that said then, let's dive in with our first item, the Moon Devotion Robe. This is a really genuinely good item that a relatively small amount of the player base will even know exists, not to mention how to actually get it. This clothing type item has various helpful effects. By far the strongest one though is Lunar Bulwark. What this does is simply set your AC to 13 while active, which for a proper spellcaster is about the best that you'll get, and it doesn't really cost you anything, it lasts until your next long rest and you can use it once per long rest. It's just a really solid item. How do you get it then? Well, that's actually the fun part. You kill Isabel, you know, the cleric of Saluna who is protecting the entirety of the Last Light Inn. Yeah, it is looted from her body if she dies. The main time that this can happen is when the Flaming Fist evades the inn to try and take her. If you let him or help him, you wind up killing her later on and then this will drop. So yeah, not exactly a path well trodden by any means, as most people choose not to sentence what is essentially an entire refugee settlement to death. Our second item today then is the Shadow Lantern. This is a unique weapon listing itself as a quest item, actually, but it counts as a club, so druids and monks can totally use this as a proper weapon if you want to, and it's actually pretty cool too as it lets you summon a Shadow Lantern Wraith once per long rest from a nearby corpse. The Shadow Wraith is reasonably strong, and a bonus summon is really nothing to be scoffed at. The reason this is rare then is both where it is and how you get it. This one is inside of Moonride Towers, specifically on the second floor, through the big door you can access some bedrooms. The one on the northeastern side is Balthazar's room, pick up one of the various human hearts that are in the room, walk over to the bookshelf and interact with the top right set of books to reveal an altar. Put the heart inside of the altar and the bookshelf will slide over to reveal a secret room. On the table in here is a ritual circle used to create moon lanterns. Specifically, only if you have Gale with you, you can interact with this because he knows what it is, and that's part of what makes it so rare. You get two options if you do this, one of them is basically telling Gale to go against Mistra's will, which you know, it's not really something that he wants to do, and if you choose to do that, then Gale will create the shadow lantern. Tough spot, specific requirement, and a decision that most people wouldn't choose so of course this is not really common in the slightest. Third up then is the Infernal Rapier. This is the last of our Act 2 incredibly rare items found in the very late stages of this act. This happens after you storm Moonrise Towers and once you enter the Mind Flayer colony down below. First things first, before entering the colony you need to have Will in your party. You cannot go to your camp once you're in the colony so you would have to do it before that. He's a cool dude but doesn't seem to be the most popular companion but to get this item you need to have him with you ahead of time. From where you spawn down in the Mind Flayer colony then simply head north to find Zora in a Mind Flayer pod. Free her and some story stuff will happen for Will, but then there is a persuasion option that pops up. If you pass the persuasion check and choose the option, you get the absolutely stunning looking and strong Infernal Rapier. So a specific companion requirement and a specific conversation choice with a persuasion check on it. The result is a Rapier with plus two weapon enchantment, plus one to spell save DC, the incredibly strong ability to use your spell casting modifier instead of the default dex modifier on weapon attacks, and planar ally Cambion, which lets you summon a little Cambian friend once per long rest to fight alongside you. It's a level 6 spell, and this is actually really quite strong as a whole. Fourth today, then, is the Band of the Mystic Stroundrel. This absolutely wonderful ring is both extremely strong and incredibly rare to have in your party's inventory, and the main reason it is found in an obscure place in a location that you can only visit one time, and you definitely have greater things in your mind if you happen to be there. Specifically, it's at the start of Act 3 in Rivington. You can choose to go to the circus, which sounds like a pleasant time. If you pickpocket the djinn, in here you can steal his ring, which stops him from breaking the game he's running. If you then play the game by talking to
to him, you will be sent off to the Jackpot Realm, which is a jungle. At the exit of the jungle, there is a legendary weapon in a box, and that's likely why you would even come here in the first place. But if you do go to the southwestern tip of this area, and then take a series of jumps so you can get a bit of height and get into the actual proper corner, you will find a skeleton just in a tiny little camp. The backpack that is beside the skeleton is holding this ring. What the ring actually does then is make it so if you hit with a weapon attack, you can cast any illusion or enchantment spell as a bonus action within the same turn. A really awesome ring for any mixed magic and martial characters that lets you do some really funky stuff. Fifth then, we have the Spell Might Gloves, and these ones are quite fun because in order to get them, you either have to do a relatively long and expansive quest with little instructions, or you have to randomly choose to try pickpocketing an NPC without any reason given to you. That NPC is Lucretius, also at the circus in Remington, basically the ringmaster of the circus. After you have exposed the fake Dribbles the Clown, this NPC will ask you to help work out where the actual Dribbles has gone. If you complete that quest by finding all the various body parts in a seven separate locations across Act 3, you get the gloves as a reward. Alternatively, much easier, you can just sort of set up and pickpocket the NPC, find the gloves sitting there with a really quite low roll requirement to steal them, and then bam, they're yours, no big deal. What they actually do then is act as the spellcaster version of the Great Weapon Master feat, giving you minus five to any spell attack rolls that you do, but making them deal an additional 1d8 of damage when they hit. It has extremely high potential for later game builds especially, just the really strong gloves acquired in a pretty obscure way. Sixth today is the Hellfire Engine Crossbow, and this one is acquired in a hell of a way. First, head to the Steel Watch Foundry on the western side of the Lower City area, break in however you can, you will likely have to do some combat while doing this. On the southern side of the building, you can pull this lever here to bring you up to an opening. Right beside that opening is a Steel Watcher arm that you can pick up. From here, simply head west to the end of the corridor and you'll see a desk with various items on it, including a targeting module. Pick that one up. Right beside you from the desk is the door to the security office of the Foundry. Pick the lock and enter, and then in a straight line in front of you is a table with blueprints for the crossbow. Not only do you have to read these, but actually pick them up and put them in your inventory too. Then from here, by the stairs leading up to the room, there's a little crafting table. Go to this table, insert the blueprints, the steel watcher arm, and the targeting module, and then you'll be able to create the Hellfire Engine Crossbow. The way to get this is actually just a bit nuts, right? There are ways to get some hints for it, but nothing that explicitly tells you all the required steps that you have to do, so this is definitely one of the rarer items around the game. As far as what it actually does, it has Lightning Arrow as a usable spell once per long rest, really strong in the right situation, then the unique weapon action Reposition Malefactor, which does half the damage of a normal attack, but also pulls the target 9 meters closer to you and doesn't have a cooldown, which makes it a really good effect to have access to. Seventh, then we get into some funkier stuff, with our specific item for this entry being the Nymph Cloak. For this one and the next one, you'll need to have access to the Counting House area of Lower City, and you need to be let into the vaults. To do this, you need to head to this location specifically in the Lower City to find the Guild's Lair. Talk your way into here, find the leader inside, and speak to them, but make sure that you have Jahira in your party when you do so. If you have Jahira with you, it will lead to information about the Stone Lord, but before you leave, talk to these two drunk little guys by the entrance, and they will tell you all the other things that you need to know. After that, head to the Counting House, which is located here, and talk to the head clerk to tell him what is going on, and then he'll let you in. Head down into the vaults, and you'll see a bit of a puzzle in front of one of the bigger inner vaults here. Step on the little platforms in this exact order. One, three, five, six. Like a keypad on a door, or even on your phone, I guess. Then the vault will open to let you into the high security area. The first time you enter here, there will be a fight, and then once that ends, you have free reign on the high security vaults. Each of these vaults contains different items and has their own unique key located in specific places, but, well, you can actually also just lockpick these. They have a DC of 30, which makes it relatively hard, but very much doable if you have someone that's actually built as a proper dex companion. And they don't even count it as stealing, so while there are guards, around watching you do this, they just don't care if you do lockpick them. So just know that it is absolutely an option to do so if you can. That said, the key for vault number one is found in the Blushing Mermaid Tavern just up the road from the counting house itself. Inside here on the second floor, you will find Captain Grizzly, who is quite drunk. Pickpocket this NPC and you'll find the key to vault one. Inside of vault one, then, you will find the Nymph Cloak item. This cloak has one purpose, and it is to let you cast the level five spell Dominate Person once per long rest, convincing enemies to fight alongside you instead for for a time. In here, there is also the Spell Savant Amulet, which gives you just a bonus level 2 spell slot and is also pretty good. Our second item note in the Counting House, then, is in High Security Vault number 2. Convenient, right? Like the last one, you can lockpick this if you are good enough at lockpicking, or you can just get the key. For this one, the key is located in the Heapside Prison under the Basilisk Gate Barracks. You can freely walk in here and enter the prison, no problem at all, and then in one of these cells is a rat named Skittle. If you use Speak with Animals, the spell, you can then speak with this rat to find out that he is a merchant who really loves rat 
puns. And one of his few items that he will sell you is the key to high security vault number two. Once you have that key, you can then open the vault, and inside of here is Janeth's hat. The effect is extremely simple and equally extremely potent, giving you advantage on both persuasion and deception checks just permanently forever. It's your talking hat, basically. Then we come to our ninth item of the day, the Wave Mother's Robe. This item is pretty cool, but the reason it is rare to get this is you basically have to cut off a pretty major avenue of content in Act 3. Specifically, it is the reward for a quest that you can pick up at the southwesternmost corner of the Lower City area over here. Talk to the NPCs leading the ceremony there, and you can start a quest of vengeance. After accepting, head to the Flim Cargo area a bit to the east across the water, and then lockpick your way in. There is a fight in here the first time you enter, but once the fight is done, you can find a secret basement entrance right near the door that you came in from. Down here, just follow the path to the subaquatic dock and talk to the engineer inside. Accuse him of the murder, and then you can kill him, which completes the quest. The thing is, if you kill him, you cut off the entire way to get to the Iron Throne. So, you know, up to you if it's worth it, but that in itself undeniably makes a reward for this quest very rare, because most people don't want to cut that off. After that, head back to the same place that you got the quest from in the first place, and they will give you the Wave Mother's Robe. Resistance to fire and cold damage, and if you are standing on water at the start of your turn, you heal for 1d4. And you also get to use Create or Destroy Water, as well as getting just plus one bonus AC, just for fun, because why not? Finally today, then, we have one last exceedingly rare piece of armor, which is the Ballist Armor. This is the reward for a very evil decision, which in itself creates rarity, of course. Early in Act 3, you can start a quest to investigate a series of murders. The objectives are relatively simple, so I won't baby you through it, just, you know, follow the objectives, do what it tells you to do, until you reach the Murder Tribunal part of it all. In this underground area, you'll be brought before a a powerful being who will decide if you are worthy of becoming basically a disciple of Baal yourself. After that, there is a choice to either kill or spare a specific person. I won't spoil it, and most people upon getting here will almost definitely spare this person. If, however, you choose to kill them, you successfully join up as a Baalist yourself, and then in the main chamber of the area there will appear a new vendor that you can interact with and buy the Baalist armor from for yourself. This armor makes enemies within two meters of you vulnerable to piercing damage, so basically double damage with piercing weapons, which is just sort of incredible and it also has plus two bonus to initiative rolls, just because why not really? Just to make it even better, because it just needed that, right? And there you have it, everyone. 10 of the rarest items in the entirety of Baldur's Gate 3, not legendaries, but items far less people have than most legendaries, and for pretty good reason. I hope this helps you round out your collection of all the items in Baldur's Gate 3, or even shows you something that you didn't know existed to add even more enjoyment to you next time around. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, Stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye